Welcome, everyone, and uh, appreciate you coming tonight. I love to talk about uh, St. Francis of Assisi, and so I'm glad you've come to uh, let me share that with you. Uh, a few of us in the room have the privilege uh, very soon of going to Assisi. We have the pilgrimage that's leaving on October the 8th. We're excited about that. Maybe some other day you can come with me uh, on another trip. Um, it'll be great fun. So, uh, St. Francis, um, you know, the, uh, I just want to begin by talking about sort of my history with St. Francis and going to Assisi. Uh, this is a view of the city. Uh, I first went there in 1984. Uh, I had a friend, that's me. <laughs> you can tell which one, I hope. Anyway, I had a friend that I was in seminary and graduate school with named Philip, and Philip was studying to be a Roman Catholic priest, and he had gone to Rome to study, which uh, that's good if you're a Catholic priest, that's a good place to go and study. And he and I had both at Duke, he majored in theology and I majored in Bible, we both minored in medieval theology and spent a little time thinking about St. Francis there, but not a lot. So I went to visit Philip, he said, um, he said, let's get on the train and go to Assisi for a week. Well, that wasn't in my plan. I was planning to see Rome and other places in Italy, but I said, well, sure. Uh, so we went uh, to Assisi, and we stayed at this uh, cool little pensione that Philip had found. It was interesting. It was staffed by this obscure uh, uh, women's, uh, these sisters, of this obscure women's order, that their, their calling is to be in ministry to the fabulously wealthy. You have to think about that. There are such ministries in the world. Philip grew up in a pretty wealthy family, so he found these people, and it was good. And so we went there. And, oh, I'm going too fast. And so we went there, and Philip was, he was an odd traveling companion. We'd known each other when we were younger, and we're kind of party guys and all that. So I thought, hey, this would be like fun in Italy with Philip. Philip had changed. <laughs> and Philip had become a very uh, prayerful person. And so he insisted that like we were on a pilgrimage to Assisi. We would go in churches, and I was ready to take photos and dig all the history and all of that. And Philip wanted us to sit in the church and pray for an hour and a half and things like that. And I was just stuck because, I mean, there was Philip. So I had to pray in churches for an hour and a half and then go to another one and pray some more and that kind of thing. It was a revolutionary week in my life. Uh, and I can't even explain it. Uh, I couldn't sleep at night, and I don't think it's because of usual travel stuff. Uh, I said later, St. Francis was keeping me awake at night. I don't know about that, but there was something that was really moving in me. And so Francis began to become important to me. Right after I uh, came back from that trip with Philip, we had a clergy retreat uh, that was, uh, there were two aspects of this clergy retreat that were interesting. Uh, I was told it was mandatory, and so I went. If I'd known what it was going to be, I would not have gone. It was, a, it was three days of silence. This is hard for human beings. This is really hard for clergy because <laughs> we're no good at anything except talking, and suddenly you can't talk. Anyway, part of the trip, though, was that part of this uh, retreat was that you took all these tests like the MMPI and the Myers-Briggs, and uh, once they took all this, then they told you about your spirituality. This was actually pretty revealing to me because I took the Myers-Briggs at the time and I was an ENTJ. I don't know if you know much about these things. ENTJs, uh, they're wonderful people, right? And, uh, but spiritually, one of the things that was cool is uh, this nun that I met with said, now if you're an ENTJ, you probably don't get off on the walk in the woods that other people seem to find so powerful and spiritually uplifting. And I said, that's right. And she said, and probably when you read uh, devotional books that are really popular, you're bored and you can't get past page two. And I said, uh, that's right. I've always felt guilty for that. She said, you shouldn't feel guilty about that. That's just the way that you're wired as a human being. She said, I bet you really love congregational singing. I love congregational singing. And she said, I bet you enjoy reading really thick books of theology. And I so did that. And so I left this woman feeling very noble. And, and, and spiritually encouraged. Then you had a second session with her, though, where she said, uh, if you want to grow spiritually, you know, you can kind of go with what you are naturally as an ENTJ, but if you want to grow, you need to think about what about ISFP, which is the opposite of ENTJ. And to do that, you, you got to do the walk in the woods, you got to read the corny devotional book, you got to do all this stuff to stretch. And then she said, uh, the world's uh, most important ISFP in history is St. Francis of Assisi. 
I did not know he had taken the Myers-Briggs. <laughs> but at any rate, it sort of said, Francis, Francis is somebody you need to deal with for, to grow spiritually. And I kind of knew that from my visit to Assisi. So I got more and more interested. I went back to, I've been back to Assisi a bunch of times. I've taken various family members there. Uh, I took a group of high school seniors graduating from our church. Uh, that was really interesting, to take people on the cusp of adulthood from relatively, from relatively affluent backgrounds to the place where St. Francis lived, because that's his story. As he became an adult, coming from an affluent background, he underwent this incredible conversion. So that was really interesting to do. I uh, began to write a lot, involved Francis in it. My first book, Yours in the Hands of Christ, a lot of stuff about St. Francis in there. I contributed to a volume called The Art of Reading Scripture about the way St. Francis read Scripture. I wrote a whole book myself about St. Francis called Conversations with Francis, in which I imagine asking him some questions and talking with him. What might he say to us today in the light of um, his life? A lot of interesting uh, sources from the life of St. Francis. A lot of people were familiar with the little flowers of St. Francis. That's a cute, quaint read. Scholars now predictively have put out you know, the definitive works of, of St. Francis and his early biographers and so on, this big multi-volume thick set. Uh, some, some, something that comes out of this that is, is really disturbing to people, but it shouldn't be, is you have all those classic things that we treasure uh, that St. Francis said. And lo and behold, it turns out St. Francis did not say them. So, for instance, this prayer, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. That first appeared anonymously in a magazine in 1898. It came out a couple years later, was attributed to somebody else. A couple years later, was attributed to somebody else. A couple years later, came out another magazine, and somebody attributed it to St. Francis of Assisi. This business of preach everywhere and when necessary use words. You see that on a lot of posters and it's attributed to St. Francis. Now he may, we don't know that he didn't say these things, mind you, but there's no record within hundreds of years of his life of him saying this. Francis actually, that second one is interesting because uh, when necessary use words, Francis was primarily a preacher who used words. Like that's what he did. He went around and preached sermons to any and everybody who would listen, including birds and fishes <laughs> and all kinds of people. So he, he used a lot of words. He also used uh, tremendous actions around that. I, for one, uh, was not remotely troubled when I learned that Francis did not say, the Lord made me an inst instrument of your peace. Uh, my theory on that is that there, there are all kinds of great quotations in history that are attributed to the wrong person or they're attributed to multiple people and we don't know who really said it. You know, I for one wouldn't mind if there was this free-floating poem out there that was really eloquent that said, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. And people thought, I bet James Howell thought of that, <laughs> right? It's kind, of, uh, it's kind of high praise that they would attach this to you. One of the things that happened early in the life of Francis, uh, he, he, he was, his early biographers, uh, held him in such high regard, and they felt he was so much like Jesus that they began to um, embroider the story a little. They began to expand the story a little. So then everything that Jesus ever did, he did it also. Like, he fed 5,000 people. He, uh, one of his followers betrayed him to somebody in Rome. All these things like this. But they, they thought he was so Christ-like, those things must have happened to him. Uh, as well. There's a lot of bad stuff on St. Francis. There's a long list. The most popular bad things about St. Francis, you have this novel called God's Pauper by Nikos Kazantzakis, who, um, you know, he's famous from uh, The Last Temptation of Christ and uh, Zorba the Greek and so on, which I think are fine books. This book on Francis is, it's awful. Uh, I just can't say. And then you had this movie that came out in the 70s called Brother, Son, Sister Moon, which is a very uh, 70s hippie romantic movie that has no kinship to the real life of St. Francis. So there it is. There's some great books about St. Francis. So this uh, great English writer, G.K. Chesterton, wrote a lovely book. It's not a history of Francis' life. It's a series of reflections on his life. G.K. Chesterton, St. Francis of Assisi. It's just absolutely a lovely book. 
Uh, my favorite, this is just if you want to learn more about Francis, my favorite author who takes the life of Francis and reflects on the meaning of his life for today is this Roman Catholic guy who lives in Assisi named Murray Bodo. And he's written just a lot of books. We'll quote him a couple of times as we uh, go along. So when we come to Assisi, one of the ways, this is always interesting to me, is that for years, if people knew anything about the life of St. Francis, they didn't read it a book, and they sure didn't see it at a multimedia presentation like this. The way they learned about the life of St. Francis was from art they saw on the walls of their churches, right? If you think about so many people through history, what they knew about Bible was they looked up at frescoes on the wall or paintings on the wall or stained glass. That's where they learned the stories of Abraham and Isaac and so on. So this is the church in Assisi. It's the Basilica of St. Francis. It's where he was buried. They built it to bury him in shortly after his death. A lot of people think there's some irony in that. Francis uh, was all about poverty. He was all about pushing away riches or taking riches and using them to help the poor. And when he died, what did they do? They built a fabulous Gothic <laughs> basilica to bury him in, of course. I'm glad it's there. It's a wonderful church. It has two levels. In the upper level, it looks like this, except it's always crowded with tourists. And you may have seen in the news a few years ago, there was an earthquake and some of the ceiling, some of the frescoes on the ceiling fell. They've restored all of that now and, and cleaned it also, and it looks fabulous again. And along the walls, if you look at that closely, there are scenes, there are different panels where Giotto and some of his students uh, they did, you know, a fresco. This is when you, you know, paint into the wall and it becomes part of the uh, frescoes that narrate the life of St. Francis. Uh, really interesting. The lower level of the church, this is really just a splendid place, has all these arches. And again, along the walls and ceilings, and when it's arched like that, the walls are the ceilings, right? There are other scenes from the life of St. Francis and scenes from the Bible that were pertinent to Francis. Uh, and his early followers. Uh, and there we began to get a feel for the story of Francis, which I'll now try to narrate to you. Francis was not born with the name Francis, interestingly. Uh, his given name at birth was Giovanni, and for us that's like John, like John Clarkson, Giovanni in Italian, John. Giovanni Bernardone. Uh, he was born, we don't know when, this is really interesting. We know that he was baptized on Easter of the year 1182, and they did baptisms then once a year in the Basilica right? So he was, he was born after Easter 1181 or before Easter on 1182, the date we don't know. Uh, he was born, this is really interesting, uh, those who are going to Assisi with me will visit a church that might, not many tourists go to, and I don't know why, called San Rufino. San Rufino was actually still under construction when Francis was born, but his parents brought him there to be baptized at this baptismal font that you see uh, pictured there. This is, uh, to my knowledge, the greatest baptismal font, the most productive baptismal font in history because three saints were baptized in that one font. I don't know of any other church where three saints have been baptized. One was St. Francis, one was St. Clair, and another was a saint that nobody's heard of from the 19th century called Gabriel. Uh, the Emperor Frederick Barbarossa was baptized there. It's an amazing baptismal font. His parents took him there to be baptized, which is what everybody did in those days. His, Francis, his parents were named Pietro and Pica. This is a statue of them um, outside what traditionally is, is their home in Assisi. Interesting parents. Uh, and it's always dicey, isn't it, to try to draw conclusions in our world from the way parents were in the Middle Ages. Uh, I'm going to do a class next month on Martin Luther. And uh, what some psychiatrists did uh, back in the 60s is they looked at Martin Luther's father, who was a harsh, overbearing man, and they tried to deduce from that why Martin Luther turned out the way he did. Turns out all men in those days were harsh, overbearing men. So that doesn't really explain anything. If you have a harsh, or overbearing man today, that has certain kinds of implications, right? Francis's parents are interesting Pietro was an up-and-coming cloth merchant. Uh, he, was, uh, he was probably born in something what for them would have been like the middle class, but he was making money in the new uh, merchant economy. There was increased travel. There was a burgeoning economy that eventually issued in the Renaissance. 
People are making money in trade, and Pietro capitalizes on this. So he lives there in Assisi, but he's a cloth merchant, and he goes to France and deals in French merchandise. And he brings all this French clothing home, and it's why Francis has the name Francis instead of John. He's baptized as Giovanni, but his father brings all these French fabrics home, and Francis starts wearing French clothing, which was regarded as very chic and cool and stylish. His father probably introduces him to other tradesmen from France who teach Francis how to, um, how to feign a French accent. He learns French romantic songs. And so people nicknamed him, what, Francesco, which means Frenchy, right? Like he's the French guy in town. And he was regarded as so cool, just so very cool. Pietro was raising his son to enter into the cloth business and continue this upward mobility that he was enjoying. Francis disappoints that. His mother, whose name is Pica, that's probably not really her name. One of the places that Pietro went and traded fabric in France was the region of Picardy. If you know France, Picardy. That probably means she is a woman who is from Picardy. It's a nickname in the same way that Francesco Frenchy is a nickname for somebody who's French. We don't know her real name. Her nickname was Pica. She's from Picardy. She has a softer heart than Pietro because once everything goes south between Pietro and his son Giovanni, Francesco, uh, Pietro eventually throws uh, his son in prison. Pica sneaks out in the middle of the night and takes the key and unlocks the gate and lets Francis out. You can imagine the marital stress in their house, right? Any number of interesting religious leaders have had the same kind of background. St. Augustine, uh, his father Patricius was an up-and-coming man and could be cruel to his son. His mother, Monica, was soft-hearted, sided with her son against her father interesting dynamics. We always think everybody should come from a happy family, but so many great leaders in history, it seems to have come from unhappy families, as it turns out. Francis's first biographer describes Francis's upbringing <laughs> not in a kind way. He talks about his love of frivolity, his penchant for extravagant clothing, a squanderer of his property. He was rich. Why not? His parents reared him to arrogance in accord with the vanity of the age. By long imitating their worthless life, he himself was made more vain and arrogant. I read this to someone one time, and they said, uh, Francis is like a normal kid, like in Myers Park. Should I not have said that? I, what, this, is a, this is a religious viewpoint of what is a normal life for the upwardly mobile right? But it's saying it, it's extravagant, it's a squanderer, it's arrogant, it's vanity. Uh, as Francis is coming along, though, a lot of things start to happen to him. One day he's walking through the city square. He's the coolest of the cool. And uh, there's a puddle out in front, uh, this temple of Minerva, which is still standing there. We'll visit this place when we go to Assisi. And sort of Sir Walter Raleigh, like this guy takes his cloak and he puts it down over the puddle so that Francis doesn't get his feet wet. And, and Francis, you know, partly he feels like, yes, I deserve this kind of thing, but partly he's moved by the man's humility, and he ponders this, and he dreams about it for a number of weeks. Uh, what, what did that mean? This is that temple of Minerva where that happened. Francis, as many uh, Europeans did, went on a pilgrimage to Rome. He went to St. Peter's Basilica. That's the wrong slide. He went to St. Peter's Basilica. If you go to St. Peter's today, of course, you see the one that was built, Right? on the heels of the Protestant Reformation. You know, Luther is campaigning against the Pope's fundraiser, uh, indulgences, getting people out of hell by paying money. That money was used to build St. Peter's. That hadn't been built yet. Francis went and visited the former St. Peter's that was still standing from the Middle Ages. It looks something like this, artist belief. He went expecting to be moved and impressed, but instead what he saw was a church of foolishness, a church of arrogance, a church of wealth, a church that didn't care for the poor. He's beginning to wonder, like, is this really what Christianity is about? Is God asking me to do something? He, he's disillusioned by this. Uh, Assisi goes to war with the neighboring city of Perugia, and Francis, like all good young men, uh, he joins the army, they go away and they fight. Uh, he's wounded. He's... Um, held in house arrest in the prison in Perugia that looks like this. It can still be visited today. And while he's in prison, he's near death, and he begins, he's probably got a horrible fever. He begins to hallucinate. He has horrible nightmares. But also during this time, 
He keeps having these very vivid dreams where he believes that God is speaking to him. And he's trying to listen, what is God saying to me? Is God saying to me, be a great soldier? Is God saying to me, be, be a great cloth merchant like your father? What is, what is God asking me to do? Uh, he begins to think about that, and he has a sensitive heart, and begins to think about people that are poor. He has tremendous possessions himself. So he begins to do this curious thing. He, he's, he's got a lot of cloth. He's got his father's fabrics from France. They're really cool and chic. And begins to run into people who are in need. They don't have sufficient clothing. He starts to give them his father's fabric. And they're grateful, and he's sort of catching on to the contagion. What is this? To give what is precious to you to someone else who doesn't have. He begins to discover that he likes doing this, so he does it uh, more and more. He begins to pray intently. He goes to this little broken down church right outside of the city of Assisi that nobody went to any longer. It was crumbling called San Damiano, and he kneels before this crucifix every day, and he prays the same prayer every day, day after day after day. You know, you and I get impatient, I think, sometimes about answered prayer, right? Like, Lord, I prayed twice for two days. Like, where's the answer? And when you read great saints in history, they tend to pray over and over and over for weeks and for months and for years. They're not as impatient as we are. So for months and months, Francis went to the church, and all throughout the day, he would pray this prayer over and over in front of the crucifix. This is the prayer of St. Francis, if you want the prayer of St. Francis. And it goes like this. That's the, uh, the very crucifix that he prayed before. Most high, glorious God, and that if you re- receive my emails, I've been commenting on these recently, enlighten the darkness of my heart. Like, what do you pray for? Like, you pray for enlightenment in the darkness of your heart. And give me, O oh Lord, what, is he, what does he ask for? This is interesting. I want a correct faith, which implies you, you could have a wrong-headed faith, right? A certain hope, perfect charity, wisdom and perception. That's something to pray for. And then this, that I may do what is truly your most holy will. Like we tend to wonder about what God's will is. We question God's will. We speculate about what God's will is. Francis, very simple, he wants to do what is truly God's most holy will. He prays this over and over. I threw this in just for fun. There are a couple of statues of uh, Francis around around Assisi that are unusual. And he's lying down on the ground looking up. So I'm laying down on the ground one time, got my photo taken (laughs) next to him. Francis was famous for doing this. He liked to sleep out of doors, uh, and he liked to sleep out in the open. And he slept on the hard rock looking up at the sky. And when he talked to his friends about this, he said there are two parts of this. One we can understand better than the other. But looking up into the sky, as he, as he would lie there in the dark, he could see the stars, the moon. And he would think about Psalm 8, O Lord, you know, when I look at your heavens, the works of your fingers, what is man that you are mindful of him, yet you have made him little less. He would ponder this kind of thing, just the wonder, the immensity of God's creation. He could see more stars than we can see, right? You have so much ambient light, it's kind of been ruined for us. The other thing, though, is he would lie on the hard ground, which is the kind of thing that we, we would just never want to do. Um, like, I, I, I joke about it. Like, I'm a, I'm a sissy when it comes to traveling. Like, I love to travel and go hard all day, but at night, I want a bed. Like, God created hotels for a reason. Sort of my view, I, I don't camp. But Fran, Francis wanted to sleep outside he, for two reasons. One is he wanted intentionally to be uncomfortable. This is as un-American as you can get. But he wanted, quite intentionally, to be physically uncomfortable. Because he found when he was physically uncomfortable, and this was a common thing in the Middle Ages, that it, it roused him out of the sense of self-indulgence. It also reminded him of the discomforts that Jesus underwent for us. Jesus didn't come down and live a very comfortable life, you know, sleep on soft feathered beds. Jesus came down and was uncomfortable for us. He also had this thing that he, he, as he would lie on the rock, he would think about Jesus being like the rock. Like, like rock of ages. And he felt that when his head was on a rock, he was very close to what God had created, and he was very close to Jesus in the discomfort of sleeping on a rock. 
Francis prayed that prayer over and over in that church, San Damiano, and one day the cross spoke back to him. Jesus, in that crucifix, spoke to Francis and said, uh, rebuild my church, for as you can see, it is falling into ruin. And Francis thought that meant the church that he was praying in, San Damiano, was broken down. Uh, one of the things in those days to be a soldier, you had to have masonry skills because they would go off to battle. You'd have to build a wall somewhere. You'd have to build a fortification somewhere. So he knew how to do, do masonry. So he began to, he rebuilt that church with his hands. He thought that's what Jesus was asking him to do. Turned out Jesus was asking him to rebuild the church, right? Like bigger than that. Uh, the next big encounter that Francis had was with a leper. Uh, in those days, you know, if you think about like the movie Ben-Hur or any of those old Bible movies where there would be a leper and people would, ah, you would run and scream. They were terrified, right? It's contagious disease, can be fatal. They didn't understand it. There are a lot of lepers in the valley outside Assisi, and everyone avoided them like the plague, literally. So Francis is walking down the road one day, and he'd been thinking about the way that when Jesus encountered lepers, he didn't run from them, he didn't judge them, he didn't ostracize them. Jesus embraced them. So Francis saw this particularly disgusting leper, and he said that he, he wanted to throw up. He was so nauseated by the sight of this man. Then he heard Jesus speak to him and asked him to love the man. So he went to the leper and he embraced him. And a lot of the rest of his life, this isn't well known, Francis spent a lot of his time caring for lepers. In several cities, he built with his own hands buildings that became hospitals for lepers. A lot of the brothers spent their lives caring for lepers in a society that shunned and did not care for lepers. <clears throat> France is still in process of figuring out what God is asking him to do. He goes to the church San Nicolo in the center of Assisi, and he goes to the priest and says, uh, open the Bible at random three times, and whatever, God, whatever you read there, that will be God's direction to me. So the priest says, well, okay. So he opens the Bible the first time, and he, he reads what his eyes fall on. Jesus said, sell all you have and give it to the poor. Francis said, I'll do that. He said, open the Bible again. He opens the Bible again. It's that place where Jesus sends the disciples out two by two, and he says, they say, he says take nothing for your journey. Francis said, I'll do that too. He says, open it one more time. Third time, it's uh, he who would save his life will lose it. So Francis is off and running. Again, when Francis read the Bible, he took it as his to-do list for the day, right? And he didn't shy away from the things that we tend to explain away. So all you have and give to the poor. We finesse that one. Like, oh, well, he means we need to be willing to do that. Or he can't mean that because Western civilization would break down. Francis was naive, and he was in that state of mind, just whatever Jesus asked him to do from the Scriptures, he was happy to do it. So he's giving all of his possessions away to the poor, and it turns out his possessions actually are his father's possessions. And his father, I mean, he's a wealthy cloth merchant. You don't become a wealthy cloth merchant by giving your clothing away. You don't become a wealthy cloth merchant by just giving it to the poor. Oh, my gosh. Wasting it. So his father keeps scolding him, telling him not to do this any longer. But Francis can't, can't help himself. He keep, keeps giving all this fancy French fabric and clothing away to the poor. So his father sued him. Again, he was put in jail. Pika let him out. They put him back in jail. <laughs> then they had the big trial out, of, out in the city square. And uh, so uh, you see Pietro there, he's making the charges. Uh, it's really interesting. What Francis did in this moment, whatever he was wearing, he acknowledged he'd received those clothes from his father in some form. So he stripped naked and handed those clothes back to his father. Now, the artist Giotto was not entirely happy with this, right? So he has uh, the Bishop Guido covering up. Although, if you talk to medieval art historians, this is interesting, partly Guido is covering Francis for the sake of modesty, but also the bishop is taking his cloak and he's wrapping it around Francis. It's actually a sign of blessing that the bishop approves of what Francis is doing. Interesting, isn't it? His father sues him, and Francis' response as he gives his clothes to his father, this had to be heartbreaking, is he said, no longer is Pietro Bernardone my father, but from here on my father is our Father who art in heaven. Uh, people take that different ways, and I try to write about this in my book. Um, biographer said that for the rest of his life, I mean, Francis and his father, they still live in this very small town, 
that every time Pietro would pass his son, uh, he would spit on the ground and turn and walk away. Francis, as somebody that has a sensitive heart, this had to be painful for him. Francis had to have been around when his father died. You know, did he grieve? What was all that emotion like? Uh, it also calls into question one of those things that we tend to do. We, we, we tend to say, like, family's the main thing. But in so much of Christian history, what amazing thing happened, it, it's actually around the, the breakup of a family. And Jesus says this weird thing, right? Jesus says, I've come to set father against son. It doesn't mean it's his will for fathers and sons to be divided. But it does mean that the family relationship is not the top thing for Jesus, right? Sometimes when we follow Jesus, it creates a rift within a family. It certainly did within Francis's family. Now, in that basilica on the lower level, one of the ways that this, uh, what Francis had done got depicted is uh, the, the, they, they painted the scene where Francis gets married. Now, Francis never got married, uh, but he's marrying a woman here, and there's Jesus officiating at the wedding. Can you see that detail there? Jesus is officiating, officiating at the wedding of Francis and this woman, and the Latin under uh, the woman gives her name, which is paupera, which is poverty. So Jesus, instead of marrying a wealthy young woman from Assisi, he marries poverty. <laughs> it's interesting, the little kid down front, see this little kid? It looks like he's throwing rocks at him. And that, that's what's happening. And that represents temptation, right? If you decide to embrace a holy life, you, if you decide to do the hard thing that God asks you to do, there's always temptation. There's always somebody trying to knock you away from that, trying to drive you away from it. It's fascinating. Uh, Murray Bodo comments on this. I love this observation. The call of Francis, coming as it did at the emergence of a moneyed middle class, like I said, the economy was changing in Europe in those days. People were having money they'd never had before, was a divine antidote to the disease which would infect society and, and the individual from then on. One's personal value, value and self-esteem would by and large be measured in proportion to an ability to make money. This is true in our world, friends, if you hadn't noticed this. Francis saw what money would do to the spirit. Christ alone is the fullness of life, and the compulsive pursuit of money more than anything else distracts from what really brings life. Marie Bodo does this stuff over and over. Some of the Francis did, and he talks about what it means for us. Francis's friends, since he was this cool Frenchy guy, they were the other wealthy young men of Assisi. And they started wondering, what the heck has gone on with Francesco? Uh, so they started inquiring. They're puzzled. And, uh, and so they begin to inquire. And so Francis spends time with them. So this is uh, Francis' wealthy, this is an artist's depiction, of Francis' wealthiest friend named Bernardo. And Bernardo invited Francis to come in and spend the night at his house. And he talks to him. He's trying to figure out what Francis is about. And so finally it comes time to go to bed. So, so the, they go to sleep, except Bernardo isn't really going to sleep. He, he's... He's like squinting. He's peeking over at Francis to see what he's doing. And Francis is peeking at Bernardo. And once he thinks Bernardo is really asleep, he gets up and does all through the night what he did all through so many nights. As he prayed all night long. And what he prayed all night long was just one prayer over and over. My God, my all. My God, my all. I think a lot of us might pray that kind of thing and say, oh, yeah, Jesus, he's my all. But we actually keep a lot of other stuff for security also, right, just in case to back up, right? But Francis really gave it all. God, Jesus really was his all. Bernardo saw this and was moved, and he also gave all of his possessions away. Then a young man named Leo gave all of his possessions away. And then, and guys kept doing this. And the fathers of the city of Assisi grew terribly alarmed. And what they did was they herded them all up down in the valley and they quarantined them because they thought some disease is infecting these young men and it's making them crazy. And that kind of was true. There was a contagion. It was uh, spreading. Uh, oh, I went the wrong way. Sorry about that. Uh, well, one of Francis' followers, this is funny, a few of you heard me talk about this before, was a guy named Brother Juniper. And Brother Juniper sort of outdistanced all the other friars in his zeal to give possessions away. Uh, so, what he, so he gave all his possessions away, and then he's living with some of the other brothers in a house, and he had this bad habit of he would go out during the day, and he would see somebody who was poor, and he would give them the clothing off his back and come home naked. 
And this troubled his superior, and he said, you know, look, dude, I doubt he said dude, right? He said, look, uh, Juniper, he said, uh, you know, stop giving your clothing away. And Juniper said, uh, just out of love for Christ, Christ we gave her, I, I just have to give everything. So, the, so the, um, the, the brother said, all right, as your superior, I order you that if you are out and a beggar comes to you, you, you do not give him your clothing. This is your vow of obedience. So Juniper said, well, okay. So he's out the next day, and a poor man comes up wearing really ragged clothing. And uh, Juniper says to him, he says, uh, I can't give you my clothing because of my vow, vow of obedience, but, but if, you, if you steal it from me, I won't stop you. <laughs> and then the story was that Francis would go, and uh, if there was somebody poor outside, he'd, he'd take other people's stuff and give it to the poor. So they hid their things when he was in the house because he gave everything to the poor. It's delightful. That'd be a great project, wouldn't it, right, if we could give other people's things to the needy. So Francis and these wealthy young men who had become poor young men, they left, they left the, the protected walled city of Assisi that sits upon a hill, beautiful place, and they came down into the valley where lepers and just the riffraff lived. And they built little huts there, and that's where they lived and where they met for prayer. Some of these huts have been recreated. Uh, that's me with our former youth guy, Joe Ham, and teenagers that we took there. And, and they lived in these huts, and amazing things happened there. Um, it was an austere life. They, they did a lot of fasting. Again, they slept on the ground, trying purposely to be uncomfortable to get in touch with Jesus and his discomforts. And one time they were on an extended fast, and in the middle of the night, uh, Francis heard one of the brothers in this little hut. He was just sobbing. And Francis went to him and said, what? And the brother said, he said, I'm, I, I have to eat. I'm so, I'm so hungry. I'm so ashamed. I'm sorry, but I just have to eat. Francis woke everybody else in the house up and said, we're all going to eat. Because he didn't want to shame the one who was weak. That's just a lovely thing. Uh, Francis went further down into the valley uh, and did this amazing thing. Now, there's a huge church built there today called St. Mary the Ancient, Santa Maria degli Angeli, and it looks like this, gaudy, baroque, ugly, a sin church. Uh, inside this church, though, is something amazing. Sitting in the middle of the floor of this massive church is this little tiny stone church, and that's a, what, another one of those churches that St. Francis rebuilt with his own hands. It's so little, like 12 people can shoehorn in there at once, just a little tiny church. They've added the art on the outside sense and the little, little um, um, cupola on the top, right? And this church is there, and it's a very sacred place for the Italians to go and uh, pray. Tati Dellinger, who's traveling with me to Italy, has been painting this. She painted this little church. Isn't that cool? So Francis went there, and it's the first place that, where he started a hospital for lepers. Uh, he decided to go to Rome. He's starting this new movement, but it doesn't really have official church authorization. So he goes to Rome to see if he can get the Pope to okay what he's doing. <laughs> So he comes to the papal palace, San Giovanni in Laterno, and he knocks on the door, and whoever answers the door for the Pope comes, and he's a poor, ragged-looking guy, probably smelly too, and he sends him away, like, the Pope can't see someone like you. So that night, the Pope has a dream, and it's presented in this fresco by Giotto. The Pope is dreaming that the church is falling down, but it's being held up by this one poor man in ragged clothing, Right? And so the Pope remembered that somebody had told him that a poor, ragged guy had come to the door that day. So he told him, he said, go out in the streets, find that poor guy, and bring him back. So he brought Francis back, and the Pope said, oh, tell me what you're doing. So Francis presented his plan to the Pope. This is an amazing moment. I wish we had time to spend on this. You know, churches always have plans and strategies and all this thing. So we actually have a copy of Francis' plan for what his movement was going to be about. And, uh, you know, you would expect like a world strategy, you know, clever things, right? All it is is just a bunch of Bible verses. Like, can we sell all we have and give it to the poor? Can we take nothing for our journey? <laughs> it's just this pastiche of kind of the hardest of all the Bible verses. He hands to the Pope and says, this is what we want to do. And the Pope says, go, be blessed. Uh, so, so he does so. Uh, Francis does a great many things that are interesting. I'll, I'll mention just a few of them here. This is one of Giotto's frescoes uh, from a, an incredible moment that I love, and I think it's so pertinent to the world today, although sometimes when I talk about it, people get really angry. Uh, Francis lived during the time of the Crusades, and if you think about the Crusades, this is when the Christians, beginning the year 1099, 1095, said, uh, we have to recover the holy sites and the holy land. They, they've fallen into 
Arab hands, and, and that just can't be. So we have to go recover Bethlehem, Jerusalem, all these, the Sea of Galilee, all these sacred sites. So all the soldiers, they took up the cross, right? They put the cross on their shields, and they marched off the Holy Land. They had these bitter warfares with Muslim soldiers. And so it's those days. And the, 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 the crusaders, uh, these, these were just, I'm sure some were holy people who were trying to serve God, but on the whole, these were, these were wicked men. So you have stories of things like um, if you ever go to Germany and if you get to visit the city of Worms, W-O-R-M-S, you know, where Luther, the Diet of Worms, and so on, there's a Jewish cemetery that dates back to the Middle Ages. It's, it's a haunting cemetery. Because what happened is the Crusaders uh, decided we're going to go to the Holy Land. So they're marching, and when they got to Worms, Germany, there was a Jewish community there, and ju just kind of for practice and for good measure, they just slaughtered all the Jews in the city. Just, we're just on our way. We'll kill some Jews along the way. So the, 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 this, this, this is what the world was. So Francis uh, announced that he was going to go on crusade with all these other guys. Like, this is kind of shocking. So, so he gets to the crusade, and there's the, this place in Egypt at the time fighting, a place called Damietta. And you can picture the scene, you have the, you have the Christian soldiers are arrayed, they've got their armor and their, their battle axes, their catapults, like they're ready to go to battle. And then across no man's land, you have the Muslims, and they have their sabers, and it's a tense situation indeed. And Francis, just unarmed, barefooted, walks across no man's land, <laughs> right? And, and as he gets to the Muslim side, they, uh, they draw their sabers. Like, it's such an easy mark. But it, it was such an easy mark, like, why kill him? Like, there's no danger with this guy. It was kind of a novelty. thought it was weird. So they took him to the Sultan Malik al-Kamil, who was a very educated, enlightened guy, as it turns out, from historical records. They took him to Malik al-Kamil and said, oh, this guy came across no man's land. He's unarmed. What is this? And so the, the Sultan said, oh, I'd like to talk with him. So they spent three days together and it became friends. Francis explained to him Christianity. According to one story, you, you, know, you never know with these things if it's kind of later legend or if it's factual. I like to think it's factual, but who knows. The legend says that after they talked for free three days that the sultan said to Francis, um, I would convert to Christianity based on you and what you're about, but if I did, my soldiers would kill me. This is probably true. What he did do was by peace in that area for a number of years. Of course, it didn't last, right? So this is striking to me because we have so, don't we? We have so much tension in our world between kind of the Western world, maybe it's a Christian world, I don't know, then the Arab world, it's kind of a perverse Muslim world. There's all this tension, but we actually have all kinds of tension in our world. That's not the only tension in our world, right? We have uh, in our country, you have Trump fans and Trump loathers. And there's all kinds of divisions, people that think homosexuality is the height of wickedness and people that embrace it. And just have, you have all these no man land places. And what do we do? And we tend to just, you know, hurl venom back and forth at each other and we want to win and defeat the other side. I just keep thinking about this model of Francis that he, he did this, uh, he, he took this great risk and he engaged in a radical act of love and hospitality, and he just went to the other side and, and befriended somebody. I don't know, that seems unfeasible and all, but I mean, what other solution is there to the troubles of our world in this kind of thing? I love that moment. Uh, if you go to, there's a little museum in the Basilica of St. Francis. <laughs> It's got all kinds of interesting things. The one on the right is the one that I love. Uh, the Sultan, as a parting gift, uh, gave to St. Francis this uh, elephant tusk that he had been using to summon the Arab warriors to battle. Francis brought it back to Italy, and he used it. He would, he would blow into the thing. He did it to summon the monks to gather for prayer. Like, you love that kind of transformation, right? Uh, Francis, Francis was a peacemaker at so many levels. There's another story. It may seem legendary. I don't know. It's the kind of story that, yeah, if you're a, if you're a cynic, you scoff at it. I'm a cynic by nature. It's a great story. Some more thing. How do you make peace in the world? Francis went to the village of Gubbio. Some of you heard me tell this before. He goes to the village of Gubbio, and uh, the gates are locked, and the citizens are all tense and armed. And Francis says, well, yeah, what's going on? Why are you guys so tense? 
And they said, well, there's this wolf up in the hills, and he's been terrorizing the city. He's, he's come in a couple times. He's even eaten a couple of children. He's a horrible wolf. We're frightened of him. We've tried to apprehend him, haven't been able to do so successfully. Francis said, I, I must go visit my brother, the wolf. Notice the brother, my brother, the wolf. So he goes up in the hills, and the citizens are you know, looking from the city wall. They figure he's going to get chewed up by this wolf. The wolf comes out, and the wolf's snarling. Francis looks like he's a goner. And just as the wolf comes up, Francis uh, holds up his hand and the, makes the sign of the cross. The wolf sits down. And uh, Francis speaks to the wolf and says, oh, Brother Wolf, I, I've heard that you've created a lot of havoc in this area, great wickedness. You've, you've frightened the people. You've even harmed children. This is a great sin against God. You need to repent of your sin. The wolf bowed his head. Then Francis said, but I, but I think I know why you've been doing what you've been doing, and that is that there's clearly no food up in these hills, and clearly you're just really very hungry. What you really need is some food. The wolf lifted his head. Francis said, I'll make a deal with you. Uh, if you promise never to terrorize the citizens of Gubbio again, I'll get them to agree to feed you for the rest of your life. So he went in the city. People were very nervous at front. He's bringing this wolf in. <laughs> He said, you feed him, he won't terrorize you. They weren't sure for a while, but they started giving porridge to the wolf every day. And the story was that he became like a pet to them. And when the wolf died two years later, the citizens of Gubbio uh, grieved. It seems like a made-up story, but there's actually this interesting thing. Archaeologists were digging up a street there uh, about 30 years ago, maybe. And they found a little small casket. They assumed it was a child's casket, and it was dated to the time of Francis and then when they opened the casket, there was the uh, skeleton of a wolf in there. Who knows? Again, even if it's a made-up story, it's a good story because it's a parable about how do you make peace, right? You apprehend people, they're evil, but maybe what are they hungry for? Is there a way to make peace? Uh, a lot of the frescoes and everything Francis like show this kind of thing. Like he's elevated on a cloud. He was just known for his immense prayerfulness, his immense holiness at every turn. One of the places that our group will visit is a town called uh, Greccio. And uh, this seems so commonplace to us, but in the year 1223, uh, the world had never heard of a manger scene or a creche. That just, nobody had ever done that before. And if you see art, uh, this is easy to find. Christian art, before the life of St. Francis, they depict Jesus as an infant, but he doesn't look like an infant. He looks like a little potentate, like a little, like, mean dude, king sitting on Mary's lap. Lisa and I saw one when we were in Ireland. I mean, this baby Jesus, had, he was buff, like <laughs> muscles, he had a sword. It was scary. And so what Francis did in the year 1223, he went to this friend uh, in the city of Greccio and said, you know, get hay, bring cattle. I want to create this thing. So they brought the animals and uh, people came and they sang. Francis preached about the birth of Jesus, and it was really one of the first sermons in history that the church had ever heard talking about uh, that Jesus was small, that Jesus was vulnerable, that Jesus was a human like everybody else, that Jesus came at great risk, that Jesus was tender. All, that no one had ever heard this stuff before. And Francis said, that this is who God is. God came as a gentle child because God wants us to be gentle. God came as a gentle child because God wants our love, not our fear. God came as this gentle child so we would treat each other and all of the children with great uh, kindness. It was a beautiful moment, and after that, there have been, you know, manger scenes everywhere. So, and this was especially important in those days because, again, uh, this is during the time of the Crusades. Uh, at about that time, there were Christian soldiers trying to recover the city of Bethlehem, right? So they're fighting and killing to recover the city of Bethlehem. One of the things that Francis said is Bethlehem can be anywhere. And that's important. Bethlehem can be in Greccio. Bethlehem can be in Charlotte. What he's saying is you don't have to fight and kill people for that Bethlehem. Jesus comes anywhere. Bethlehem can be anywhere. It's a lovely thing, isn't it? Uh, Francis, a lot of people have seen this. Yeah, Francis, he, his statue is always making in people's gardens and associated with birds and so on. The association with birds is really pretty interesting. Francis was walking on the, the road one day, 
And uh, there are a bunch of birds that are chirping, and his followers trying to get the birds to be quiet, kind of like Jesus' disciples trying to get children to be quiet. <laughs> and Francis Stern, he preached a sermon to the birds, well, not about the birds, to the birds. And he says to the birds, God has given you beautiful feathers and wings to fly and trees to make your nests and worms to eat and the sunshine and all and streams to drink from. You should be grateful. And you should always praise God with your song. Uh, one day he was walking by a stream and there, there were some fish and he preached to the fish and said, God has given you gills so that you can swim underwater and there's food to eat under there and you should be grateful and praise God in all that you do. And this is interesting, isn't it? So we, we talk today about being green and we're trying to protect the environment. Francis wanted to protect the environment, but not because he wanted to save the world or ensure that uh, we were healthier or anything like that. For Francis, it was exclusively that whatever he saw in the world, he believed that God made it. And that's why you want to be kind to it. It's why you want to protect it. He wouldn't step on a roach. He wouldn't step on a spider. He wouldn't let you kill various creatures. They should all live. They're created uh, by God. That's his view of being green. The really interesting dramatic thing that happened late in Francis' life is this receiving of the stigmata. Uh, maybe hard to see in this image here. Francis uh, went to a place called Laverna, and it was the Feast of the Holy Cross when Christians think about the crucifixion of Jesus. It comes in uh, September of each year. And he's praying before the crucifix in this church. And what you and I tend to think, if we think about the death of Jesus, is we thank Jesus for dying for us. We thank Jesus for dying in our place, we, this kind of thing, which is normal for Christians. What Francis did is he, he was so attached to Jesus, he was so absorbed by his love for Jesus that he, he prayed this. And I should have put it on the slide, but I didn't get it done, I'm sorry. He said, my Lord Jesus Christ, two graces I ask of you before I die. The first is that I may feel in my body the pain which you underwent in the hour of your crucifixion. The second is that I will be inflamed with the love that you felt so as to undergo the suffering for us. That's interesting. He looked at the wounds of Jesus. He wanted to be so close to Jesus, he wanted to feel what Jesus felt. So what happened in that moment is that Francis came to have wounds in his hands and in his feet and in his side. They bled intermittently for the rest of his life. He hid them carefully from all but his closest friends who would catch peaks now and then. After he died, people who didn't believe it came and certified. He did, he did in fact, have these wounds. Um, he's always depicted in art with those wounds in his hands and in his side. As his first biographer put it, Francis was always with Jesus. Jesus in his heart, Jesus in his mouth, Jesus in his ears, Jesus in his hands. He bore Jesus always in his whole body. Now this is, this seems, this may, to some of you this may seem like weird Catholic stuff, but you know, this is so, so stigmatics, there have been hundreds of them through history, holy people who prayed and experienced these same wounds of Jesus. The most famous of all stigmatics was this priest named Padre Pio in Italy. If you ever travel to Italy, his image, it's in restaurants, souvenir shops. He's very beloved to Italians. And he had these wounds and very few photos of the wounds themselves. Uh, and blood from until he um, threw his death. Uh, that's yours truly with uh, the only handwritten piece from St. Francis that we have. Francis wrote a little letter to one of his friends named Leo, <coughs> uh, and it's housed uh, in this little shrine. And I love this letter that Francis wrote to his closest friend. He said, I'm speaking, my son, as a mother would, because I am putting everything we said on the road in this brief message if later you need to come to me for counsel, I advise you. In whatever way it seems better to you to please the Lord God and to follow his footprints and poverty, do it with the blessing of God. I love that. Francis didn't overprescribe what his followers were supposed to do. On his deathbed, he said, I've done what is mine to do, and now it's up to you to do what is yours to do. Like, you've got to figure out what that is. But it's defined by what does it mean to please the Lord God and to follow his footprints and his poverty. 
Francis' last uh, writing is pretty familiar to us. We have hymns, musical settings of this. Francis wrote this great canical, praising God for all these things. Praise be to you, my Lord, with all your creatures, especially brother, son. He has this family connection to creation, especially brother, son, who is the day and bears likeness to you. And through sister moon and the stars, through brother wind, sister water, brother fire, mother earth who sustains us, produces fruit with flowers and herbs. Francis finished that song, and then not long before he died, he was walking through the street of Assisi one day, and he saw the mayor and a wealthy citizen of Assisi in a bitter argument with each other. They'd been longtime foes and rivals. So he began to sing that song about blessed are you for the creatures, but then he added a stanza on the spot for these two guys who were fighting that goes like this, blessed be you, my Lord, through those who grant forgiveness through your love and who bear infirmity and tribulation. Blessed are those who endure in peace, for by you shall they be crowned. I think that's lovely. It's one thing kind of to praise God for creation. What about for forgiveness? What about for mercy? What about for being able to get along with other people? Then as he lay dying, he sung yet one more stanza to that song. Praise be you, my Lord, for our sister death, who no one escapes. Blessed are those whom death finds in your most holy will, for the second death shall do them no harm. He's only 44 years old, but he's embracing death. We tend to go only 44 years old. You have to remember in the, in the Middle Ages, people didn't live a long time like we do. But he dies at 44. Uh, he's laid down great grief from his followers. This is Giotto's beautiful fresco of his friends gathering around him at his death. This is in... Uh, <coughs> Uh, the Bardi Chapel in Florence, so much emotion in these faces. Uh, it's a beautiful thing. One person that came after Francis died was St. Clair. Uh, St. Clair in um, Clair Ofreducio was a young woman, somewhat younger than Francis, grew up as his neighbor in Italian. Her name is Chiara. Uh, she is moved by Francis. She sees him preaching. She sees his example of poverty. She's from a very wealthy family. She's engaged to be married to another wealthy man. This is how it went in Italy in those days. She sneaks off one night and comes to Francis and said, I want to be a member of your order. Well, it's guys. It's brothers, right? What's he going to do? But he accepts her, and she begins to gather other wealthy young women around her, the poor Clares, who are still active all over the world today. This is the church where uh, St. Clair is buried there in Assisi. A while back, I did a program that some of you may have come to. I just want to close with this. I've talked way too long. <clears throat> about thinking about Pope Francis and St. Francis. When Pope Francis became Pope Francis, he, that wasn't his given name, right? He took that name intentionally, and it's really interesting. Uh, we read about the account of his being elected. When the number of votes was reached, making me Pope, the Brazilian, this is Francis talking, the Brazilian Cardinal Claudio Hummus came up to me, kissed me, and said, don't forget the poor. Immediately thinking of the poor, I thought of Francis of Assisi. He decided to choose that for his name. There's never been a St. Francis before. Austin Iverly, his biographer, says, no one ever thought a pope could be called Francis. It would be like taking the name Peter or Jesus. John Allen, commentator, the name Francis, this is so interesting, is a whole program of governance in miniature. Like, if you take the name Francis, like, you got to have a plan to go with that. Uh, Leonardo Boff said, it would have been a big contradiction for previous popes to choose the name Francis, <laughs> right? Because they were kind of un-Francis-like. So Francis' whole pro program has been to try to be more like Francis. So popes have typically worn all this regalia, and Pope Francis has simplified it radically. Uh, all there's anything, other anything, interesting things that Francis has done. You know, famously, he rode the Ford Focus instead of uh, the uh, papal limousine. Instead of staying in the papal palace, he stays in this very small guest house. Francis is known for his love for uh, creatures, for animals, which seem to warm up to him very much like St. Francis. And then we go back to this moment where St. Francis embraces this leper. This is a statue <coughs> in Assisi commemorating that moment. One of Pope Francis's many wonderful actions was he had a papal audience one day, a big crowd outside St. Peter's, and he noticed in a crowd this man named Venezio Riva, uh, who has this neurological condition that manifests itself in 
the skin situation. Venetia's life, his mother brought him to Rome just to see the Pope. His whole life, people have avoided him and averted their gaze, laughed at him, spit at him, ridiculed him, all of this. He, he came. The Pope saw him in the crowd and, and asked him to come forward and embraced him, not briefly, but he held him, held his head, kissed him for several minutes. Venetia said, I felt like I was in heaven. No one had ever been kind to me before. Very uh, St. Francis-like uh, act. Uh, a lot more I could say I would love to say, but that's kind of uh, some things from the life of uh, Francis. Let me add, I talked an hour, which I didn't mean to do, uh, but there it is. Let me ask you if, uh, if you need to scatter, that's fine. But while we're here, do you have questions or anything that you'd like to ask about, wonder about, comment on, something? You know, I don't know, anything? Yes? Good timing. I was a little confused by the, the uh, uh, Christmas uh, story. Yes. That no one had ever thought of Christ being in a manger. The Bible has Jesus being born in a manger. What I was saying is in the history of Western art, uh, no one had ever done a manger scene, that kind of thing. And when Christian artists thought, let's paint the baby Jesus, he's, he's like, he's a, this potentate. He's got a sword. He, it's interesting. Because they want to say he's the king of kings. He, like they love the power image. What Francis help people see what it's as plain as the nose on your face. But churches tend to do this, right? You kind of forget what's the most obvious thing. The most obvious thing is that Jesus is humble. Jesus is vulnerable. Jesus was weak. Jesus was small. Jesus didn't overpower his foes. He actually submitted to his foes, right? He let them have their way with him. But we forget that. The whole premise of the Crusades, they put crosses on their shields, conquering Christ. But the real Christ is humble, suffers. Sorry if I confused that. What else? Was he ever reconciled with the Trinity? So uh, we assume he remained at good peace with his mother. With the father, we don't know. The, you know, the records only say that <clears throat> you know, his father spat at him for the rest of his life. Uh, in my book, I speculated on this a little bit and wondered you'd like to think the dream would be that as Pietro lay dying, Francis came to him and they managed to make peace. But sometimes that's, that's the Hollywood ending that a lot of people don't get in their own lives, right? Like, we always think it's that way. We, for, we forget this, don't we, in a place like ours. We, we think everybody's from a happy family. We kind of assume everybody's a happy family. And a lot of families are really broken and they really struggle, and it's really painful, and it's really hard, and there's not shame in that. Those are just people. That's the family they happen to get, <laughs> right? They shouldn't be ashamed if you're from a broken family. My daughter married a man on Saturday. His father is living, and he did not attend the wedding. He had something else he needed to go do. And we think, oh, we, he need. Colin need not be ashamed of that. It's, it's like hard enough without people pitying him, right? <laughs> so lots of people from broken families, lots of people are in what appear to be happy families, but they're actually badly broken on the inside in ways that nobody knows. We're going to emphasize domestic violence next month in this program that we're doing with the Park Church. A lot of families look terribly happy, but there's abuse secretly in the home that's been born for a long time. Anyway. I like the fact that a lot of our great saints come from very dysfunctional, badly broken families. It's kind of hope for everybody, isn't it? Anyway, what else? Yes, please. Saints 
So we was asking about, so um, when we say St. Francis, that title implies correctly that he was officially authenticated as a saint by the Roman Catholic Church. And they have an arduous process that people go through. So Mother Teresa, for instance, you know, made the cut pretty early. Usually it takes years to get there. She got there pretty quickly. She's now St. Teresa, not just Mother Teresa. So they have this arduous process by which that happens. We don't have anything like that in the Protestant church. Now, I like the fact that we can honor and recognize the Roman Catholic saints. And we also have our own kind of saints and heroes. I wrote a book about these years ago, and I, I, I talked about not just saints, but also Christian heroes, right? People that we look up to. Uh, and they're all, oh, you know, Martin Luther, I mean, whoever, people who've made a huge impact uh, in the history of Christianity. You may know some in your own um, life. Sometimes I wish within the Protestant church we had, we had some way of, it'd probably only create huge controversy, right? But kind of deeming, there's some special people that you want to emulate that you... So, it's inter- so the Catholic view of this, this is pretty interesting. If you're Roman Catholic and you have an image on your wall of a saint, let's say you have St. Catherine or you have say, whoever. So you have that saint and, and they think several things about this, which I wouldn't argue with for a nanosecond. One is uh, they speak of praying to a saint. A lot of us kind of think about, think this, if, you, if, if, you, if, if, if you'll stay with me on this. A lot of us who are Protestants have had somebody or another who's died, but we have some sense of their kind of ongoing presence with us, that maybe there's a sense in which I'm with my grandmother or I can, she's watching out, something like this. They have a sense that you can, you can actually talk to saints, not that you don't pray to Jesus, you don't pray to God, but you, you can talk with the saints and they're, and they're with you, they're advocating for you with God. There's also a way which you look at those saints and you, and you, you want to be like them. So in my house, I have several images of St. Francis. And on my better days, I try to take note of that. And it makes me a little better than I would have been if I'd looked at something else on my wall, right? So you try to imitate the saints. The other thing that's cool, though, is that they have this idea that uh, the saints are, are watching you, right? So you have the image of the saint on the wall. It's not that you're looking at them. It's, it's that they're watching you. That cuts two ways. You know, one is like, they're watching me. But the other is like, they're, they're, they're watching you, like, in a loving, caring kind of way. Somebody remembered this thing I told in the sermon years ago and asked me about it. <clears throat> I'll just mention this since my daughter got married Saturday. When Lisa and I first were married, um, you know, we get back from the honeymoon and, um, you know, it's time to go to sleep, and on the uh, night table next to the bed, there's this uh, big framed photo of Lisa's parents. <laughs> I just thought, could we move that? Anyway, so somebody asked me if my daughter had a photo of us. I, no, she doesn't have that. <laughs> but that they're, they're looking at you. Like, that's an interesting thing. So, saints, I don't know. Some, somebody else had a hand, and then I'm going to call. Somebody else had a hand up. I forget. It was. Yes. Randy. Do you understand what Ben said? Because just when you were talking about they were embroidering the stories of Francis early on. I can't see what you're holding up. Oh, it's the little flowers. So the so the little flowers, it's a that's a kind of classic collection of early stories about St. Francis. Uh, you know, historians would say a lot of that's true and a lot of it is kind of kind of veers into legend. And sometimes, sometimes we're troubled by that, but I, I keep thinking about this. I'm not too troubled by sort of uh, legendary-like spin on somebody's life. We do this all the time, Right? I mean, if you ask me to tell me to tell you about my grandfather, Papa Hal, I'll tell you about him, and it, it's pretty factual. I'm not making anything up, but I think his love and presence for me was so great that in my memory, it probably becomes grander than the reality was, but then you can't say the reality wasn't that because the reality was that, because that's what my experience was, right? You see what I'm saying? Like if you're doing a film documentary, 
my story of them would look better than the film documentary, but you don't live with the film documentary of anybody. You live with the real memory of people. So we actually do this all the time. So someone of great sanctity, you would expect that he would be remembered well, although actually we live in a culture, don't we, that is so jaded and so cynical, if anything, we're more likely to reduce the wonder of someone and poke holes in it and say, he probably wasn't that great. And that's the saddest commentary I think I possibly could make on modern society, but I think it's true. Anyhow, we're way past time. You're patient to listen to so much. Thank you for coming tonight. And uh, <laughs>